the fourth and final module of this program, we will discuss the management of persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. In this module, we re will review the management of PPHN from the framework of three groups of strategies, directly promoting pulmonary blood flow, indirectly promoting pulmonary blood flow via increased systemic vascular resistance, and optimization of oxygen uptake. Finally, I will describe the indications and salient features of the use of ECMO in this population. The first component of PPHN management is to address the underlying disease state. For example, in RDS, surfactant therapy may aid in avoiding or improving PPHN by opening up collapsed alveoli and improving gas exchange. In meconium aspiration syndrome, the meconium can deactivate surfactant, so surfactant replacement is indicated for persistent hypoxemia. Similarly, the appropriate use of antibiotics in sepsis or pneumonia is critical. This figure from a 2015 Neo Reviews article is a great illustration of the goals of clinical care and the variety of therapies employed. Certainly, there are institutional variations in the approach to acute PPHN management, but this is an excellent broad overview of care principles. Please pause the recording and review the goals, supportive therapies, and possible interventions employed in the management of PPHN. Patients with PPHN can range in the level of intensive care they require. However, supportive care is common to all patients with PPHN. Infants with PPHN need optimal temperature and nutritional support and a minimization of noxious stimuli, such as loud noise and frequent handling. Additionally, therapies directed to treat the underlying cause of PPHN need to be determined and employed. In Module 1, we reviewed the concept of QP to QS ratio, where Q is flow, QP is pulmonary blood flow, and QS is systemic blood flow. In PPHN, we can use strategies to address either side of this ratio. First, we will discuss methods to increase the QP directly. The most potent vasodilator of the pulmonary bed is oxygen. Thus, optimizing oxygen content is a mainstay of PPHN management. The most available and efficacious therapy for PPHN is providing supplemental oxygen. Oxygen has direct relaxation effects on the smooth muscle cells and inhibits hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which is an autoregulatory reflex. Acidosis may worsen hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, so most centers aim for a pH greater than 7.25. It is really important to consider that more is not always better. Hyperoxia has been shown to precipitate paradoxical pulmonary vasoconstriction in animal models. Progressive evidence has led to sequential decreases in target PaO2 over the past decades, with commonly used PaO2 targets now ranging from 55 to 80. Reduction of oxygen consumption is critical and is achieved through techniques such as mechanical ventilation, sedation, whether intermittent or continuous, and even paralysis. A careful risk-benefit balance must be undertaken when using neuro neuroactive substances in neonates because of the association with impaired neurodevelopment. One consideration to improve oxygen delivery to the pulmonary vasculature is the administration of surfactant, which will recruit collapsed alveoli and improve VQ matching. In patients with PPHN secondary to parenchymal lung disease, multicenter trials have shown that early administration of surfactant with lung recruitment strategies is associated with better outcomes and reduced risk of ECMO or death. An important consideration to improve oxygen delivery to the pulmonary vasculature is the appropriate use of mechanical ventilation. Optimal lung recruitment to 8 to 9 ribs on an inspiratory chest x-ray using PEEP or mean airway pressure will help to decrease PVR and improve your QP-QS ratio. Ventilation strategies aimed at limiting barotrauma and volutrauma should be employed. Conventional mechanical ventilation, high-frequency oscillatory ventilation, and high-frequency jet ventilation can all be used to meet this strategy, and there is considerable institutional variation in approaches to ventilatory management in the setting of PPHN. Additionally, the underlying cause of PPHN should be considered when selecting a ventilatory strategy. In Module 1, we reviewed the vasoactive substances that drive pulmonary vascular constriction and relaxation. Now we will see how drugs target these pathways. As noted in Module 1, endogenous nitric oxide released by endothelial cells leads to vasodilation in smooth muscle cells through activation of cyclic GMP by guanylate cyclase. Exogenous nitric oxide has the same effect as endogenous nitric oxide. Inhaled nitric oxide acts as a potent and selective pulmonary vasodilator without causing a significant decrease in systemic vascular resistance. INO is preferentially distributed to ventilated units of the lung resulting in increased perfusion of these ventilated units, which improves VQ matching. When given as inhaled gas, the NO reaches the alveoli, diffuses into neighboring endothelial and smooth muscle cells, leading to vasodilation by increasing levels of cyclic GMP. We discussed the calculation of the oxygenation index, or OI, in Module 3. INO therapy is generally initiated at OIs greater than or equal to 20, and most commonly initiated at a dose of 20 parts per million. 
Higher doses of INO are not recommended because they're associated with increased levels of methemoglobin and nitric dioxide. INO is effective in improving hypoxemia and reducing the need for ECMO. INO's only FDA indication is the treatment of PPHN in term and late preterm infants greater than 34 weeks gestational age. Care must be taken in weaning INO when the clinical condition improves, as exogenous nitric oxide suppresses endogenous nitric oxide production. An abrupt decrease or cessation of therapy can result in rebound pulmonary hypertension. The exception is that rapid discontinuation of INO should be performed in infants who do not respond to treatment with INO. If therapy is discontinued promptly, then endogenous suppression can be prevented. Several contraindications to INO use exist, which include left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and severe LV dysfunction. These are conditions that cannot handle increased LA and LV volume. In the past decade, the use of other pulmonary vasoactive substances besides INO has increased dramatically in the care of infants with PPHN. Sildenafil, available PO or IV, also acts in the nitric oxide pathway. It promotes vasodilation by inhibiting phosphodiesterase 5, which prevents cyclic GMP from converting into its inactive form, GMP. There are a number of additional drug therapies in emerging clinical use for the treatment of PPHN including endothelin receptor antagonist and prostacyclin agonist. Their use is largely limited to the management of chronic rather than acute pulmonary hypertension, though considerable variation exists between centers. Previous management strategies were tailored towards increasing pulmonary vascular dilation, which increases QP in the QP-QS ratio. Alternatively, other strategies are directed at increasing SVR, thus decreasing QS to normalize the QP-QS ratio. Since blood will flow in the path of least resistance, when SVR is increased, pulmonary blood flow may be encouraged. There are a variety of ways to increase SVR. Fluid boluses with normal saline or lactated ringers, blood products if needed, and vasopressors can all be employed. Vasopressor therapy is generally utilized after one to three volume challenges fail to achieve target mean arterial pressures. There is no definite pressure of choice. Many centers initiate vasopressor therapy with dopamine, where others preferentially use epinephrine or vasopressin. Hydrocortisone may also be of value in elevating the systemic vascular resistance. It is likely that your institution has a preference about how to increase SVR in the setting of PPHN, and it is important that you know what that institutional preference is for this situation. The avoidance of hypotension is essential in PPHN. It is associated with cardiac dysfunction and deterioration of hemodynamics and can precipitate the need for ECMO. When the aforementioned strategies fail, ECMO may be used as a therapy of last resort. The use of ECMO is predicated upon the assumption that PPHN is reversible. Many centers consider an oxygenation index greater than 40 or AA gradient greater than 600 despite aggressive medical intervention as an indication for ECMO. In ECMO, blood is artificially oxygenated outside of the body and returned to the patient. There are two primary modalities, VV, which is venovenous, or VA, which is venoarterial. In VV ECMO, blood is both removed from and returned to the right atrium, generally via a dual lumen catheter. VV ECMO is most typically used in patients with near-normal cardiac function, as the heart must continue to be the pulmonary and systemic pump. VV ECMO is generally recommended in PPHN because superoxygenated blood is returned to the right heart and thereby enters the pulmonary circulation, promoting further vasodilation and reduction in PVR. In venoarterial ECMO, blood is removed from the right atrium and returned to the aorta, bypassing both the lungs and heart. VA ECMO may be required when there is significant cardiac dysfunction or where technical limitations, such as patient size, prohibits the use of VV ECMO. When considering ECMO, one must take into account the risk for neurodevelopmental impairment as well as the need for anticoagulation. Furthermore, if your patient is in a setting that does not offer ECMO, Care should be taken in determining the ideal timing of transfer when initial medical management is proving unsuccessful. Neonatal medical ECMO use has been decreasing, in large part due to the decreased incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome. This declining incidence is due to changes in obstetric management that discourage significantly post-term deliveries. Advances in ventilatory management, INO, surfactant, and new medical therapies have and may continue to reduce the need for ECMO. In this module, we reviewed the management of PPHN from the framework of primary groups of strategies, directly promoting pulmonary blood flow, indirectly promoting pulmonary blood flow via increased systemic vascular resistance, and optimization of oxygen uptake. Finally, we described the indications and salient features of the use of ECMO in this population. 
This is the final module of our program on PBHN. Thank you for your attention. We would like to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Organization of Neonatology Training Program Directors, Neo Reviews, and Abbott Nutrition for their support of this educational program. This concludes this module.